Hello everybody, it's Brian for GadgetUnit.com bringing you part 10, the last one, of my sub $300 PC build series and in this video I'll be showing you the UEFI BIOS, Ubuntu, Windows, some Windows gaming, as well as a basic CPU temperature test. So here's the BIOS, there's an easy mode as well as your typical advanced mode and here in the easy mode you'll find a lot of useful information at a glance including CPU temperatures, voltages, memory info, fan speeds, your boot priority layout, as well as a few other options but going into the advanced mode you'll find your typical set of options and information and the next few clips show you some of that and because this is a UEFI environment you can use your mouse in addition to your keyboard to go through the various menus I'm used to the old way of doing things so I used my keyboard for most of the adjustments in the BIOS so now it's time to check out Ubuntu. I wanted to try Linux on here just to see how it goes since Linux is generally a very lightweight operating system. And I picked Ubuntu because it's generally the most straightforward and popular option for giving Linux a try. And I'm sure that there are a lot of other Linux distros out there that give even better performance and use a generally lower memory footprint. But you can see in this next clip here that the boot process doesn't take very long as at all. Excuse me, And... And once it actually boots up, I could talk a little bit about performance. I'm just doing a voice over here. In terms of performance, it's not too bad. It's pretty good, actually, but nothing earth-shattering. I never connected Ubuntu to the internet, even though that the USB Wi-Fi adapter that I had plugged into it was working. So it probably would have been a little bit more faster and more optimized for my particular hardware. And I apologize for the focus that you're going to see here in a second once I open up the word processor program right here. This comes pre-installed with Ubuntu, which was a nice touch. It's not really not a bad piece of software. It does what you would want a word processor to do. It also has a spreadsheet program as well as your presentation program, much like PowerPoint. And that about does it with Ubuntu. I didn't really mess with it too much, but it seemed to work just fine. So now it's time for Windows 8.1 Professional 64-bit and you'll see here in a second that the Grub bootloader that was installed with Ubuntu is still being used but obviously it works fine with Windows because you can see Windows Boot Manager there. So now we are booting it up. You can see that we were only at the boot screen for a couple of seconds and here we are at your Windows 8 start screen and that fast boot was thanks to Windows 8's fast boot feature so it boots up very quickly despite being used on somewhat of a low-end processor and your traditional spinning mechanical hard drive. And here's the desktop. After you boot it up, of course, it still takes some time before everything runs smoothly, but in general, performance is quite good. It handles your everyday, day-to-day -day tasks very well. Here's the Windows 8 Store app running, and there were some app updates, so I went ahead and had those update themselves. And you can see that web performance is at least with Internet Explorer, just fine. I had no issues browsing the web. And now it's time for some gaming. I tested several games, all of which were generally older titles because the integrated CPU, or excuse me, the integrated GPU on the G3220 CPU simply isn't strong enough to perform well with newer games at usable settings. Of course, a dedicated video card of almost any kind or any cost probably something that's at least $75, will most likely run circles around the integrated Intel HD graphics. So first up, as you can see, here's a racing game called Flat Out. Its graphic settings were maxed out, except for anti-aliasing and anisotropic filtering. As for the resolution, it's set to my monitor's maximum native resolution of 1920 by 1080 for full HD gaming. Triple buffering was also enabled, and you can see that once you're actually in the game, performance is quite good and it's pretty consistent, generally hitting 60 FPS all the time, except during a few situations where there are a lot of carnage and different things going on. So I'd probably recommend decreasing the resolution to about 1600 by 900, which will still retain the 16 by 9 aspect ratio while giving you a more consistent frame rate of 60 FPS. So next up is Flat Out 2. Uh, obviously, it's a very similar racing game to the first one, but with some more modern types of vehicles and different types of tracks. And the graphic settings were, again, maxed out at 1920 by 1080, again, with the lack of anti-aliasing and anisotropic filtering. And here you can see that the frame rate isn't quite as good as the first Flat Out, 
but it's consistent enough to where you could probably play it without too many problems. So I would personally recommend decreasing the resolution to 1600 by 900 to increase your frame rate quite a bit. If I were to play this on this particular processor, I would probably bring it down to 1280 by 720 which will most likely give you a solid 60 FPS while playing. So next up is none other than the original Halo, and you can manually change the resolution of the game by adding a startup argument for the Halo executable file, but I opted to stick with the game's native resolution choices, and the only 16x9 resolution that I found was 1280x720, so I went ahead and used that. The graphics settings were all maxed out, and once I joined this random Blood Gulch server, you can see that the integrated Intel HD graphics can handle it without any problems, even online, as you can see here in some random server that I chose. And I personally think that it's still cool to see people playing this older game online, and there are plenty of players playing it. It works just fine. There are custom servers that have been around for a long time. This is a custom one. You can see there's a tank on top of the cliff up there somewhere and I just died so that means it's time to rage quit with alt f4 but Halo it runs really well don't really have to worry about that game too much so next up is an online multiplayer mod for Grand Theft Auto San Andreas called multi theft auto and the graphic settings here are all pretty much set to low but I am running it at 1920 by 1080 and you'll see that while it can play fine the frame rates aren't too consistent, so this particular map that the game is playing, it's a pretty low-end map. There aren't too many graphics elements going on. So this particular map here, you can see that at the start, there are dozens and dozens of cars spawned inside of each other. So that will go ahead and bring your frame rate down quite a bit. This particular server limits the frame rate to 45, S uh, 45 FPS so that people with higher frame rates don't get an advantage than those who have a lower FPS because there is quite a bit of a noticeable difference between players who have 45 FPS and somebody who has something lower, maybe 20 FPS. So the person with the higher FPS will be able to take off faster and things like that. And that's basically what I was getting at the start of the map because all of the cars respond inside of each other. But as the cars space themselves out, the frame rate got a bit better to where it's not that bad. But if you do plan on playing this one, I'd like flat out too, I would recommend decreasing the resolution quite a bit, which should increase the frame rate. So next up is another older game called True Crime Streets of LA that I originally remembered playing on the PlayStation 2, which is also how I started with the original flat out. Um, yes, I was a console player before I was able to get a good gaming computer. So this game only has a couple of resolutions to choose from, but the game's graphics details were maxed out, and you can see that in this real-time cutscene, the frame rate is a mostly solid 60 FPS. But as we move out into the large open world, you'll see that things kind of go all over the place. So here it's still a solid 60, mostly 60 there. And as we get into the car and start driving around, you're going to see that the frame rate varies quite a bit, depending on all of the objects that are in your current view. And this game will basically want to limit your frame rate to either 60 FPS or 30 FPS, which is ever, whichever is more consistent for everything that's in your view. So sometimes it's more locked on to the upper 50s or 60. Sometimes it's more locked on to something lower, such as 30, a little bit above or a little bit below. And that is True Crime Streets of LA. So next up is another game. This one is called The Simpsons Hit and Run. And as far as I know, it's the first open world Simpsons game. And like the last game, I remember playing it on the PS2 and found it to be pretty enjoyable. The PC version is just as entertaining. Uh, you don't get much in the way of resolution choices, but you can manually change the resolution in the game's configuration file, which I didn't do here. So obviously we're playing as Marge, and the current control setup is a little bit weird. None of the buttons on my keyboard would move the vehicle around, so I was just walking around a little bit. And you can see that the frame rate is extremely desirable. It's above 100 a lot of the time. It's usually above 80, which is you know more than you need, so this game plays just fine. So next up is a newer game, which a lot of people will probably recognize, which is Portal 2. You can see the name of it up there, of course. I initially tested this game at the max settings with a resolution of 1920 by 1080 And you can see that here that the frame rate isn't the most desirable. It's still playable, but I noticed that there was some input lag, even though VSync is disabled. And 
We're getting less than 25 frames per second. I personally wouldn't be able to play it like that, but a lot of people probably could. Here it's still kind of low. But once you d uh, bring the graphics options down to their lowest values, but keeping the resolution the same at 1920 by 1080, frame rates were noticeably smoother and more consistent, and I didn't notice any input lag or anything like that. So we're just getting just above 30, which is usually the minimum frame rate you would want to get for a game anyway. I like to choose for 60, but not a lot of people can afford the hardware to do that. So if you want to play this game on this particular hardware setup, I would recommend dropping the resolution down to 1600 by 900 or 1280 by 720 to make the frame rate even better. So last up is Grand Theft Auto 4, a very bad console port. This game tends to perform weirdly even on high-end computers, but anyway, you can change the graphics settings to where the game will exceed the available graphics memory that you have. But when I tried that, the game wouldn't load the benchmark, so instead I left everything at their lowest possible values, including the resolution, which I just missed it there, but I think it's on 800 by 600. You can see that the Fraps frame rate count is much larger than in the other games. But once we're actually into the little benchmark scene, you'll see that the frame rates really aren't that bad. So we're above 40, I think, well, most of the time, at least 40 for most of the benchmark. Of course, now we're below 40, as I mentioned that. But if you do want to play Grand Theft Auto on here, you could certainly do so at low settings. So obviously getting a dedicated video card would better suit all of these games, but it just comes to show that even in a CPU that costs less than $70, you can certainly play some games, albeit at low graphic settings. But if all you want to do is play the game, you don't particularly care about what it looks like, you know, you can certainly do so even with the $70 processor, so you don't need to spend several hundred dollars on a gaming computer to play games. So last up in this video series is a basic CPU temperature benchmark using Prime95 to drive up the CPU temperatures and you can see what settings I was using there and I was using speed fan to monitor the CPU temperatures you could just ignore the system temperature there that's not right you can see here that after running Prime95 for a while the temperatures are all still below 50 degrees Celsius which is considered to be very good temperatures as far as computer hardware goes and this is with using the stock Intel heatsink fan Intel probably could have pushed the clock speeds noticeably higher for this processor, but that might cannibalize the sales for their more expensive processors. And that about wraps up this sub $300 PC build series. I hope you all enjoyed it. I really like, in general, putting together various systems, even though I don't really do much with them afterwards except for some software testing. But I was thinking about hackintoshing this system, but the integrated Intel HD graphics aren't compatible with Mac OS X to where you won't get hardware accelerated graphics, so you can't change your resolution, you can't watch web video smoothly, or things like that. And it just makes the user experience pretty bad, but every other component would have worked fine with Mac OS X if I had a dedicated video card in it. Everything would have been fine, it would have been a very good hackintosh overall. But that again wraps up this PC build series. If you have any comments, questions, or feedback about this or anything else, feel free to leave those down below in the comments area. But that's it with this video. So thanks a lot for watching, and I'll talk to you all very soon.